for the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for more updates. Did you know that GST subsumes 17 taxes and 13 cesses within it? Did you know that the GXT taxpayer base doubled to 1.40 crore in the last six years? Did you know, but for one meeting which was put to vote, 48 meetings of the GST went through with full consensus? Hello and welcome to another edition of Capital Calculus. I'm your host, Anil Padmanabhan. Last weekend, India celebrated the sixth anniversary of its Goods and Services Tax, or GST. By any metric, it's the most marquee tax reform undertaken in modern India. In place since 2000, it eliminates cascading taxes, that is, tax on tax. More importantly, for the first time ever, it economically unified India. Previously, businesses had to negotiate at times 36 tax jurisdictions to move their goods around the country. Indeed, it is a very proud moment. But GST is still a work in progress. There's so much that can be done. Pending reforms include rationalization of slabs and reducing the tax rates. To unpack the GST story, we spoke to Hasib Drabu. He is an economist, former finance minister of Jammu and Kashmir, and a founding member of the GST team. I began by asking Hasib his first thoughts on the sixth anniversary of the GST. Well, I think on a number of accounts, uh, if, if I go back in time when the whole design was happening, the biggest insecurity at that point of time was, will we generate adequate revenues? And I think that was one reason, and we discussed this subsequently, uh, one reason for pitching the rate so high at 28% and 18% and a bulk of the stuff going into 18%, it came in from a deep insecurity of will we be able to meet the revenue targets? So when I look back at it, the time we launched it, I was very much a part of that whole launch uh, thing in the parliament. The biggest concern was will the revenues grow? And by then, the GST Council had committed a compensation scheme for the states. So there was this huge fear. When I look back at it from that perspective, the single biggest insecurity, I think it has done very, very well. You are now with every month, you are hitting new targets of doing a lakh and a half crores a month. That's a new norm. And recognize the fact that all this happened while there was COVID and there was demonetization. Now, demonetization had in some ways eroded a lot of economic activity and COVID brought it to a standstill. Despite that, out of those six years, three were abnormal years. So you've been able to regenerate the economy and gender a growth, which I don't think even the most optimistic uh, of uh, the GST mem council members would have ever thought that your run rate will be a lakh and a half crores five years down the line. So I said, just staying on that, uh... Is this then the moment where one should approach a review of the tax slabs and the rates, given that whatever you just said, that revenues have been doing well, they're stabilized, and the initial insecurities have been belied? Um, absolutely. I mean, in fact, I have been arguing that this is a time to do two things. One, to uh, reduce the rates and B, reduce the slabs. Now, why were there three slabs or five slabs? We, of course, can't go to one rate. But could we have had three instead of five? Yes. But the reason there, which people tend to forget, the reason why we had these slabs was you were coming in from a different system which had dispersal of rates. We were funneling them into buckets to be non-disruptive and also not to shock the system which is why the five-rate structure emerged, right? So this is a time now to go back to a three-rate three structure, basically a median rate, uh, a rate at the top and one zero-rated, which is for the bedded goods, and 
cup and also reduce the rate. It automatically happen. So my own sense would be that from an 18, where you today have bulk of your commodities are on 18%, you would probably bring it to somewhere around 12 to 40, which is what the original idea was. It was only the insecurity of rate, the revenues that pushed us to do, uh, you know, kind of 28 and load some of the stuff there, demerit goods and stuff. And also bring in a 12 and a 5 and a 0 and a 28 and then the cesses. So I think that's, uh, to answer your question, yes, I think it's a good time to actually relook the entire thing because much has happened. While revenues have done very well, there are other things that haven't done too well. So it's a good time to introspect for a variety of reasons and also set up a smaller group to within the GST council itself to revise the rates, relook the slabs, and see what the buoyancies are in view of your uh, the numbers that you're generating month on month. See, I see one principle of GST has been that it does away with cascading impact of indirect taxes. So even though you got rates so high, you probably are not seeing the inflationary impact because it's a GST framework. So given that backdrop, is there a reason to believe that uh, if you lower the rate you will the revenue buoyancy will not be lost i don't see the i don't see in fact quite the contrary um while it's it's correct that there has been reduced cascading one important thing which i have been kind of uh, arguing for uh, for now almost 3 years is that you cannot have a concurrent running of the uh, mrp system with the gst the system has changed. The moment you, if you reduce rates and drop MRP, you are in a different environment. You're actually in a regular GST environment. MRP is a legacy of the production system. We are now in consumption taxation. So if you were to drop MRP, reduce the rates, you will not see a loss of voice. Quite the contrary. You will actually see better compliance. You will see more because a lot of stuff is being done to avoid GST. You look at the hotels. They have started fragmenting billings. You look at all the uh, multinational stores like the Marks and Spencers or others, they are now doing it in a different way to avoid the GST payment because it's at 18%. So uh, why that's not illegal, those are tax saving methods, but the compliance would be simpler and better if you were to reduce those rates and you would see the buoyancy not reducing. I would be honestly, I, my sense from what I've seen the numbers now doing is probably you would see better buoyancy. Haseeb is making a very interesting point here. He says by reducing rates, you will improve compliance. So you will, consequently, preserve, if not improve, the revenue buoyancy. See, because you were now talking of two things which were purely structural. The fact that you would increase the ambit of taxation was humongous. And the source which nobody recognized, and even till date, not adequate appreciation of the services taxes. So once you put, you widen the net because you have done the biggest, for me, two important things for GST. One is your federal dimension, which we'll come to. Second is the formalization dimension, that you have formalized a large part of the informal economy. Even as you, in the initial stages, disrupted the supply chain networks, they have come back into the system. <coughs> and that itself is generating what you're seeing today. Services was a hugely buoyant uh, part of the economy, which was not getting taxed. It was getting taxed in fragments at state level. Some of them, you know, not even looking at it as a revenue source. So to that extent, my uh, optimism then, and which has kind of been, uh, as you said, proven right, plus uh, going forward, is the growth in these, the formalization of the Indian economy, the informal part of the economy, which is the backbone of the Indian economy, not just in the employment, but in the output also. I mean, you would be surprised to see what is the total contribution of the India to the uh, to the uh, GDP. It is far less than the uh, informal economy. So that is the source of the buoyancy that you're seeing. So you are in some ways seeing the real dynamic of the Indian economy being translated into revenues, and that is uh, that is what needs to be recognized in the services part and the informal. Part. The part of the informal, key part of the informal economy is the small and medium sector. So, for them, the GST framework is totally alien because we know anecdotally how they, they a lot of them used to make money, money on arbitrage 
about not paying taxes, whether it's sales tax or whatever taxes at that point. So have they been impacted positively or negatively because of GST? Have they been squeezed out? It's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag. Some have been edged out. There has been consolidation. Uh, supply chain networks have been disrupted. Uh, you have seen a lot of growth of the larger firms uh, because they have cannibalized the thing. But a large segment, which is the new age segment, has come into GST through the corporate scheme because that if you are below 1.5 crores, you can, you know, you can avail of it without the paperwork. That segment, if you now see the last nine months data, that is the most buoyant part. That is what has given you the kicker that you notice. So if you disaggregate the data into size classes and see what is the relative contribution of that segment, that is the one that has expanded the most. Even as a lot of registrations of GST have been given up by some mid-size because they felt the burden of it. And on average, we have seen monthly uh, registrations, you know, being surrendered and stuff like that. But when I look at those numbers and they are pushed out by the government itself, you see a trend where the new entrants are far higher than those who are giving it up. Specifically more, the 1.5 crore segment, which was the corporation scheme, which is where um, the maximum buoyancy is being seen and the share of that is growing in the overall pie which to my mind underlies your current uh, flip of GST into 1.5 crores old, 1.5 lakh crores old. Whatever we have heard so far, the GST is nothing but a good and simple tax. Yet, we have critics among us who argue that this is the Gabbar Singh tax. For those of you who don't know, Gabbar is a dreaded decoit in the cult Hindi movie Shone. How do we balance these two extremes? I don't think they need to balance. What we need to do is understand where the Gabbar Singh tax is coming from. And we also recognize that there is need to reduce the taxes. But I say that the whole idea at that time was we were getting into uncharted waters. So there was a deep insecurity. Plus, the then finance minister, Mr. Jetley, who actually was instrumental in building the, the conservative states, you were not doing GST for one, one economy. You were doing it for 30 economies across 30 governments. It's not a bilateral agreement between uh, central government and, uh, you know, the administrative agencies. It has gone through 30 legislative assemblies. It went through parliament, right? So whatever governing tax you want to call it, it was legitimized by every single uh, elected representative body in the country, right? So at that point, the insecurity coming from guaranteeing because composition scheme for states, and honestly... I have always called it an insurance policy. That you are insured against uh, any uh, no, you know, compliance issue. If I were a finance state, state finance minister, I would not raise any revenue. I was guaranteed fourteen percent. So with that kind of a card launch of you know having said that I will you know fund you, the need today keep revenue uh, rates high was now that the revenue is stabilized, the system is looking better. The Gabbar Singh tax is on a rate issue. Reduce the rates, bring down the 18 to 12 and a half percent. No longer a governor sing back. So it's not about the either or situation. I think we need to complement ourselves in terms of running the system the way it has run. It has delivered the numbers. In six years, the GST experiment has cleared many milestones. Yet there's much more to be done. With revenues hitting a new normal of 1.6 lakh crore a month. This may be the perfect time to go back to the drawing board. I would think so. In fact, I would think so. This is the, you know, uh, moment for GST Council to gain status and gravitas as an institution of future, where you can resolve a number of things and move one step ahead. So far, we were in the first transition stage. We have now kind of, there's no deny that's a better system. We can they give it much greater acceptability, a greater consensus in the system, and it can do far more for fiscal policy and other parts, not just indirect tax, by way of discussion. The way the next finance commission, which is soon to be set up, redesigns itself. GST can have a large role to play in that. 
So it should gain in its stature as an institution. And this is the time is now. So you can call it a grand bargain, another grand bargain, GST 3.0, whatever you want to call it. But there is need to sit and go beyond the confines of what we have discussed so far. Take a larger look at federalism because there is definite stress in the fiscal federal system today. And GST can be the forum to resolve that. It is then clear that the sixth anniversary of the goods and services tax is both a cause for celebration and a moment of introspection. The idea of one nation, one tax is off to a terrific start. But yet, it is still a work in progress. Much more needs to be done. To take it to the next level, the centre and states will act to act and think together. After all, it's not just about improving the ease of doing business. The ease of living also needs to be improved. In the new economy, the consumer is king. So ease of living is as important as the ease of doing business. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Strat News Global on YouTube. Hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any updates. And please do share your thoughts, ideas and suggestions with us. I'm available on Twitter at Capital Calculus. I'll be back next week with another episode. Till then, stay safe. Thank you.